from Ellis Sharp Museum and the Hearst Planetarium, Planetarium operator and STEM educator, Travis Marlowe. Hi, Travis. Hey, how are you? Good, good to see you. Good to see you. So uh, we've got a very busy uh, schedule at the uh, planetarium uh, this summer. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> You've got um, shows that you're uh, gearing to very specific audiences, including uh, the very young. Yes. What's the thinking behind that? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the, the Hearst Planetarium and like the Ellis Museum in general, we want to be for everyone, right? We want to be inclusive and inclusive doesn't just mean you know, necessarily like disabilities or something of that nature. Inclusive means also being useful for the age groups we have, the local schools, think of this nature, right? And kids, especially younger kids, have a hard time in the planetarium because it's really not a space designed for them, right? Um, you have this show where you're talking about all these fancy things that they've never heard about and they have no way really of like connecting with it. Um, and then, you know, what are they supposed to do? Sit and be bored? Right, mm -hmm. and it's not really fair. And so the idea of the kids show was to separate a space for kids to be kids, right? To really focus on um, topics for them and to be more interactive, right? Because um, for kids, they don't want to be talked to, right? They want to talk, they want to be heard, but who doesn't, right? And so making a space where, which is what we've done now, the, the kids show for the planetarium, where kids can really interact and talk back and forth and ask questions, so. So thus you've created my first look at the stars and you do that um i think every day the museum's open at, at 12 noon mm -hmm. right wednesday through sunday yes yes yep what age group what, any age kids yeah so it's aimed between four and eight years of age is the okay. idea so once kids kind of get towards that like nine ten ish age um mm -hmm. they've kind of gotten to where they can really sit in on like the general shows and be just fine um so we're aiming really at, like those younger groups mm -hmm. So is it the, the basics, like uh, the, the Big Dipper and that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we talked about majorly three things, right? Um, the sun is the first one, uh, right? So we'll talk I about, like, about the yeah, sun. Yeah, the sun. You just don't see that at night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about the sun a little bit. Um, really, the biggest thing with the sun is kind of getting that point across that the sun is a star. Right? And there's not really anything different about the sun from other stars other than it's just really close. And that can sometimes be hard to understand, especially when like you're only going off observation and what you see is there's this really bright thing and it's special because it's different from everything else. Mm -hmm. right? But in reality, it's the same as the other billions of stars that are up at night. Um, and kind of getting that point across and trying to help um, correct that at an early age right, is kind mm -hmm. of the idea. And so it's a fairly simple introduction to the sun. And then um, after that, we talk about a couple constellations, only like four of them. Um, but, and then at the end, we talk about the moon, right? Um, and majorly, we focus on kind of the features on the moon, what the moon looks like. Um, and again, we come back to that apparent size at the end. We talk about like the real size of the moon. Because um, I don't know if you know or not, uh, but a lot of times we tend to think of the moon like bigger than it actually is, right? We tend to imagine it huge. And the reality is if you hold your thumbnail up, right, at arm's length and close one eye, right, like all the way out, close one eye, um, mm -hmm. you can actually cover the entire moon with just your thumbnail. Right? It's only half a degree wide in the sky. So it's a lot smaller than we tend to think of it. And just kind of getting those kind of ideas across. And we also try to make parts of the show where kids can interact and talk about what they see um, and engage is the idea. All right. And you've got, uh, speaking of uh, the size of the moon, the program Misconceptions in Astronomy. And so uh, right now they're talking in Washington that uh, the the Pentagon has been hiding evidence of the UFOs. What do you yeah. think? Um, I, I, I mean, you know, I'm sure there's UFOs, unidentified flying objects, right, uh, throughout history. I don't know about like flying saucers full of green men. Um, mm -hmm. That might be a little extreme. Um, but yeah, I, aliens could exist. There's a lot of space, you know, in space. Mm -hmm. But uh, relativity, and like timeline tends to kind of argue with the idea of us like having communicated with intelligent life like that. It'd also be kind of hard not to see them. Um, essentially, long story short, without like a whole lot of explanation, they'd have to be fairly close and they would have to be capable of like wireless communication, which mm -hmm. means uh, radio signals. Uh, and if you take a radio telescope and you point it at Earth, it's actually brighter than the sun because we're able of doing that. And so they would be very obvious, right? They would be right. an absolute beacon. Um, and we just haven't ran across that, which means they have to be really far away, um, which makes it hard for them to ever have been here mm. before. I, I'm with you. I, I think <laughs> if there were uh, aliens that 
they would have arrived here by now or would have yeah. uh, made themselves known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea is that, oh, they're, they're, they're hiding. When, when they're here, they're, they're hiding among, huh? oh. they, could, they take human life forms. Yeah. And, oh, well. <laughs> we'll never, we'll probably never know. We'll never know, no. Right. That's one of those questions, it's like impossible to answer. Well, that could be, a, this could be a misconception, but astronomically, uh, what kinds of misconceptions are you talking about in your program? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm actually really excited for this show. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we're going to be talking about, one of the biggest ones is going to be Pluto. Uh, Pluto is probably the question I get asked on a daily basis, right? It's like the only question I get asked on a daily basis, which is, why is Pluto not a planet? Um, and I'll give you a spoiler alert. It's not because it's just too small, right? There isn't like an arbitrary size that like determines a planet. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But the issue is, and this is like the reason that I wanted to make the show, this is actually the foundation of why I decided I wanted to make the show, is that a lot of times we're told things like, as we're growing up, oh, Pluto's too small to be a planet. That's why it's not a planet anymore. Mm -hmm. And technically, for physical mechanical reasons, that is true. Right, but the issue is that's all you're told and that's never revisited, right? And so you're left on your own to make a conclusion from there. And the rational conclusion at that point with no more information is that at one time, Pluto was big enough, they changed the size requirement and now it's too small, right? And that's, that's just- That's what I thought. Right, yeah. and that's not actually the case. We've changed the size requirements <laughs> of the planets. Yeah, yeah, and that's not actually the case. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of answering those sort of questions, I think it's really interesting and I think it helps people have a better understanding of the universe around them, right? Mm. And so that's kind of the goal. Uh, we'll talk about like a few more things. Um, I plan on talking about another question that's come up uh, recently a lot that I found interesting is this idea of mm. gas having to be hot. So in two of my programs now uh, presenting Saturn, I've been asked about like how cold is Saturn, right? Saturn is really cold, like sub minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit type. Couldn't cold. live there. Like yeah, like crazy cold, right? And so then the question I've gotten multiple times now that I've found really interesting is, oh, well, if it's so cold, how can it be gas, mm -hmm. right? Because right. the concept is like usually we're presented um, the forms of matter as water, right? So like you have gas, water, so you have water vapor, you have liquid water, and you have ice, right, mm -hmm. it's a solid. And these have a certain freezing point, and a certain melting point, and a boiling point, and all that fun stuff, right? And for mm -hmm. water vapor, the, the point of the boiling point is this, you know, 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, right, it's really hot. And so it tends to make this idea that something to be a gas, it has to be really hot, but that's just the boiling point for water, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you take liquid nitrogen, that's, you know, negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit, right? But it's a liquid. It's not solid, right? Because right. its freezing point is even colder, right? Uh, which also means that the evaporation point for it is at room temperature, which isn't that hot. And so the reason that Saturn can be really cold, but still be made of gas, in part, is because of the gas it's made of, right? So it's not water vapor, it's hydrogen and helium. Um, hmm. So just things like that. So the planet is made out of gas? Yes, yes. The whole thing is gas? The whole thing you is gas. Punch your, yes. Uh, Fist Absolutely, <laughs> all the way straight through. <laughs> yep. If your arm was really, really long, hmm. you know. Oh, you wouldn't want to land there. Yeah, <laughs> that might be an issue. Yeah. So uh, Elon Musk, I think, is he Richard Branson? Somebody wants to go to Mars. Yeah, uh, Elon Musk. I don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel you. <laughs> do you think it's realistic to even ponder the the possibility of manned mission to Mars? Yeah, so manned missions for sure. Uh, that's part of Artemis. So there's a mission through NASA right now called the Artemis. They're mission. going. They, they want to yep. go. They're, yeah. Yes, and the plan is absolutely to go to Mars. So they're going to the moon first, right? So mm -hmm. we've already gone and orbited the moon, and now we're on Artemis too. So we're going to send a manned crew to orbit the moon, and then we're going to put boots on ground, um, and then from there we'll go to Mars. And I think sending people to Mars is definitely doable. Mm -hmm. I think the question that comes up after that, though, especially when we're talking about Elon Musk, is the colonization of Mars, right? Which is an entirely different question. Yeah, we're going to wreck this planet and go try to uh, live somewhere else. Right, yes. yeah. And there's not quite another planet like Earth, right? Like, this is definitely the best one to live on by far. Um, and if you don't believe me, consider the fact that the most viable thing to farm for protein on Mars, considering, like, rocket payloads, is cockroaches. Oh. Um, so there's a good chance that if you live on Mars during the early colonization, that you're going to live on a steady diet of cockroach. cockroaches. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah, not exactly 
um, luxury. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. <laughs> no lobsters and caviar. Right. <laughs> on Mars. And the uh, other program you have is Summer Night Sky. Yeah, is that still going on? Yeah, so that's yes. going on for the rest of this month. Um, and this is one of those programs that's a staple in like any planetarium. This is our night sky, um, like introduction to stargazing type program. So this will come back around next summer as well. Um, and we'll also have a winter night sky during the winter. Uh, but yeah, this is just, this is our general audience introduction to stargazing. We talk about some of the constellations, how to find them, um, why they move kind of in the ways that they do. And we talk about like the planets that are up. So. It's all happening all summer long. Something for everyone. Yeah. At the Ella Sharp Museum. Nice. How did uh, the uh, Hot Air Jubilee, did you do something with the Hot Air Jubilee? Yeah, so for Hot Air Jubilee, we always do a, um, a particular show. It's like a simulated hot air balloon ride. Hmm. Um, so it's like a recorded show. Uh, and basically it's like from the view of being in a basket and you fly around. They kind of show how they actually lift off and how they um, fly the craft, which was really interesting. I had never thought about it, but apparently for hot air balloons, um, they keep up with the directions of like the current of the wind at different altitudes. Mm -hmm. And so to steer the craft, what they do is they're like, oh, I want to go left in the current 500 feet below me is left. So I'm gonna drop 500 feet mm -hmm. and then I'll just drift left. Or if I want to go to the right, well, the current 500 feet above me is right. So then I'll go back up and then I'll drift to the right, um, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that's the show though. It just talks about kind of what they do and how they go about it um, and it's neat. Cool, so. thanks for uh, putting on some great programs. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Good to see you. <laughs> you too. He is the uh, Planetarium Director and STEM Educator at Hearst Planetarium and Ellis Sharp Museum, Travis Marlowe. Next on the show.